so dark energy is uh, the name we give for the thing that we don't know that's causing the expansion of the universe to accelerate. It, it's something that's, that's pushing everything apart from everything else. Is it like something between all the particles, kind of like, like Samson pushing on pillars, like pushing them all or, or like... Yeah, I think it's like the yeast in your bread that causes it to rise. It's kind of pushing the, the structures in the universe apart from one another. When you're lying in bed thinking about it, what does it look like to you? Do you, do you, do you sort of visualise it in any way or is it, do you just see equations and numbers bouncing around your head? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think we know enough about it to, to kind of say, oh, it definitely looks like this. Yeah, to me it's... Um, it's, it's equations and numbers on the one hand and observations we have of the universe on the other hand. Well, we have some ideas of what it is. So one of those is, model, is a thing called the chameleon. So these are particles that change their mass depending on where they're living. And changing the mass of the particle allows it to hide from some of our experiments. So the problem with dark energy is that as well as pushing the expansion of the universe apart, it ought to come along with an extra force as well. So there ought, we ought to see kind of here between you and me, there'd be an extra kind of extra attraction. And we don't see that. And so trying to explain why we don't see those forces has been one of the big problems of, um, of understanding dark energy. Surely that means it doesn't exist. Like I can accept chameleons and masses changing and things fluctuating. But there still would be something, it would just, the, the quantity of it would be changing. But you're saying we see nothing. So chameleons help us explain why we see nothing. Chameleon becomes very heavy inside me, and so um, the, the matter inside me, uh, any chameleons that, that are produced there, they can't, they can't get out, and so they can't transmit a signal to you because they're so massive, they get trapped. These aren't protons, they aren't electrons, no. they aren't neutrons, they're not photons, they're... They're just some, they're just a, just a thing. Another, another new thing that, that we, we think helps us solve some problems that we don't understand. Are chameleons abundant? Yeah. Um, so dark energy makes up 70% of the universe So uh, at the moment. So yeah, they're, they're everywhere. So 70% of the stuff in this room are these particles which are changing mass and doing their thing. And you're telling me... We just can't see them. We can't see them, yeah. So maybe maybe not 70% of the stuff in this room because, so 70% of the stuff in the universe, but obviously matter is more densely clumps here than on average in the universe. But, but yeah, there, there's still a lot of them around and we don't see them because they're really good at camouflaging themselves. This feels a bit like you're telling me there is a room full of elephants and the elephant can change its mass from one tonne to two tonnes to half a tonne to 500 grams to 90 tonnes. But I'd still be seeing elephants everywhere. <laughs> right. So, but the fact that they, the fact that they change their masses is, is what makes them hard, hard to see. They're a force carrying particle. So in the same way that, that photons carry electromagnetic interactions. So the, actually, so the reason that, that we see electromagnetic interactions um, in our daily lives, but we don't see weak interactions in our daily lives, even though the theories look very similar, is because the, the particles that transmit weak forces are very heavy. So they can only transmit forces over very short ranges, whereas the photons massless can transmit information over, you know, as long a distance as we want. Um, and so that's why the, the fact that the mass of the chameleon changes uh, makes it hard to see because it's, it's only transmitting interactions over very, very short distance scales that, that we don't experience. But that doesn't sound like a problem of its changeability. That sounds like a problem just of its massiveness. Right. Is the problem that these particles are massive or that they are changing? So the problem is that um, if they're going to, to help you explain why the expansion of the universe is accelerating, they need to be really light because they need to be having effects over sort of distant scales the whole size of the universe today. So that, mean, that needs a light particle, but then we expect to see that in our daily lives and we don't. So we need to explain how it's changed from, from one behaviour on very very, very long distance scales to, to a different behaviour here in the room. So is the suggestion that these chameleon particles become low mass to do their business and then go back to hiding as big mass? Exactly, yeah. So they, they quickly come out of their cave, do their naughty work and then hide again? Yeah. Okay. That seems convenient for scientists <laughs> who can't find it. Right, so, so then we have to... Uh, yeah, we, that would be too convenient. We have to 
to look at what you could do to try and see them because they don't hide everywhere. What you're looking for are extra forces in the universe and you can do that in, in all sorts of ways. You can, you can have two uh, masses in a laboratory experiment and see if you can measure the forces between them. So people have, like Cavendish did that for the first time to test, test gravity. People have been doing that for a long, long time. You can measure how planets orbit in the solar system, that tells you about the forces between the sun and, and the planets and the moon and the earth. And you can look at how stars clump together to form galaxies, how galaxies form, clump together to form clusters. If you can measure that precisely, that, those will tell you about extra forces in the universe. The problem is those are all the experiments from which the chameleon hides. I thought we've already found it because we, we see this expansion, this right. increasing acceleration. So it's not hiding. In fact, it's showing itself on the biggest stage possible, but on the universal stage. We see one consequence of dark energy, but one, one observation isn't enough to build a whole theory on. We, we want to understand all the ways in which um, dark energy behaves. And, and in particular, we would, we would want to understand how it interacts with the matter fields that we're made of. Um, and that's very difficult to understand just from observing how the expansion of the universe um, has evolved. What we need to try and find the chameleon is to measure forces on things that are really tiny. Because if we're looking on really tiny scales with really tiny particles, then there isn't space for the chameleon to hide. More tiny than the Cavendish scale. Yeah. So we're, we're talking atomic distance scales. We now have the ability to do this, to measure forces on individual atoms. Um, and, so, and this relies on, on some things uh, some principles of quantum mechanics. So it's a bit like doing a double slit experiment where you put the particle in a superposition of states, one of which travels through the left-hand slit, one of which travels through the right-hand slit. And if you don't watch which slit the particle goes through, you get an interference pattern. So it's like you had a wave instead of a particle. So what we do is, is we take an atom and what, we, what we'd like to do is, is put it into a superposition of two states, one of which feels a stronger force, one of which feels a weaker force. So if you wanted to measure gravity, so sort of the gravitational strength, the gravitational attraction of the Earth, um, what you'd do is you'd have one atom moving horizontally and another one that was, that was doing some parabolic trajectory. Okay, so, so they, they, they take different paths under gravity. This is the same atom or two different atoms? This is the same atom. Instead of going through both the left slit and the right slit of the double slit experiment, it takes both paths, as long as we're not watching it. And then it's only at the end when the two paths reconverge, then we do a measurement. And what state we observe the atom in tells us about the strength of the force that was acting on it while it was in this superposition of states. So you can, you can tell what it experienced on both paths. It, yeah. it can tell you both stories. Yeah, exactly. It tells you about the differences between the two paths. So the chameleon is an extra force. So we could put some, some lump of matter in, in our vacuum chamber and there'd be an attraction between our atoms and, and this, an extra chameleon attraction between, between the atoms and, and our source mass. Um, but the, why this is so good for looking for chameleons is that because atoms are small, they, the chameleon can't hide from these atoms. It has to talk to them. And that's different from any other experiment that we've done looking for these extra forces before. And that's just what, that's what makes it super sensitive to, to the existence of chameleon fields. Why does a chameleon have to talk to an atom but doesn't have to talk to Jupiter or a bowl of lead or the sun? Right, um, so we, we talked about um, the fact that the changing mass of the particle um, tells you about the, the distance scales over which it can transmit forces. Unless the chameleon's mass can become smaller than the size of the atom, it, it, it can't hide from the atom. Right, whereas, whereas Jupiter is so big, it's easy for the chameleon kind of interaction scale to become smaller than Jupiter and, and then it can't talk. How do you do this experiment though? Because any chamber you build is going to be made of stuff and it's going to be here on Earth and there's going to be electromagnetic forces going on, presumably. There's going to be so, such a mess of force that this atom is experiencing anyway. How are you going to isolate the chameleon's force? Right, so actually... Um... Yeah, that's, that's obviously the tricky bit. So you have your atoms. In particular, it's hard to shield the gravitational effects of the Earth. So what we do is we arrange for the chameleon force to be acting horizontally while the gravitational force is acting vertically. Um, and then you can, you can set up your measurement in, which, uh, in a way so that you're only sensitive to horizontal forces. And in that way, you can, you can decouple the two effects. Electromagnetic forces have to exist within our experiment because it's how we control 
the, the atoms, how we move them around. And so they're, they're a bit trickier to deal with, but if you're, if you're careful, then, then they're a sort of subdominant thing that you have to, you have to control. Presumably you don't go to the, the cupboard in the lab and open up a jar of chameleon particles. <laughs> how do you, you just bank on chameleons being in there? Yeah. They're, they're everywhere, so they're, they're going to be inside your vacuum chamber. We're planning to build this experiment at Imperial. It's an experiment you can do with, with current technology. All you need is, is a vacuum chamber and a laser. So the laser is what helps you move the atoms around. Um, and then you just need a, a way of, of cooling the atoms down so that there isn't a lot of thermal motion kind of happening that's de destroying the, the, the effects that you're looking for. Those are all things we can do. And this is an experiment that, that lives on a table. You have one atom. You shine a late, so and this atom is living in its ground state. Okay, so it, it's not excited. Do you know what it's an atom of? Uh, so normally rubidium we'd use. Um, and you shine the photon on the atom. Uh, and if, if you've chosen your laser beam carefully, your atom absorbs that photon and it gets excited. But now you have to conserve momentum. You're in, your atom was standing still, but the photon that came in had some momentum. Now there's no photon anymore, so your atom had to pick up the momentum of the incoming photon. So now you've got a way of moving atoms around. But if you don't make a measurement at that point, you don't know if the atoms absorbed the photon or not. So now it's, it's in this superposition of states, one of which is standing still, one of which is moving along. You do that three times, basically. You give it a kick in one direction, you give it a kick back, um, and then there's a, a final uh, kick from the photon that, that brings our two paths back together. So one of which was just standing still, one of which was moving. The atom, or the, the part of the atom, the part of the state of the atom that, that moved, that's been moving around, has been going closer to a, uh, a mass, which is a source of, of our chameleons. It's, it's a source of this extra chameleon force. And so the two paths have experienced kind of different, different chameleon effects. So when you bring them back together, the ones that have been traveling are in their excited state. The one that's been staying still is in, in, in the ground state. And so you can make a measurement of your atom and the probability that you see it in its excited state is proportional to the strength of the chameleon force that it's been feeling as it's been moving around. So you, you're measuring how many atoms come out in the excited state and that tells you about what extra forces have been, have been acting on the atoms. This is quite exciting. This is like, this is... Well, this is, this is really showing science working. The point is, Hooke reports this, okay? Now, did he make it up? Did he have an aberration in his telescope so he couldn't see it? Did he have a spot in his eye, okay? Until somebody else has seen him, has reproduced it, you can't be sure of that. But you see the principle, it's, by publishing here, you are stimulating debate, stimulating more observation, and the science becomes that bit more secure.